Okay, so thank you everyone for attending my talk. Um, my name is Shirin Montazeri and I'm with the Google Quantum AI team. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about low power silicon germanium cryogenic lunar amplifiers for quantum computing applications. So lunar amplifiers are key components in uh, many cryogenically cold applications, such as quantum computing, where you have V signals. Uh, that needs to be read out or for instance in terahertz astronomy where you have weak signals coming from outer space and you have readout chains or other applications such as deep space networks, ballon balloon telescopes and many more applications in physics that needs cryogenic cooling. Uh, in this presentation I'm going to focus on quantum computing application and the need for low power lunar amplifiers. Uh, so quantum computers seem to be promising in outperforming the computational power of classical computers for certain problems. And we know that qubits are the building block in, of the quantum computers and they can be at any state of zero and one or any superposition of these two. And this quantum behavior uh, basically uh, provide much larger computation space for quantum computing and result in faster calculation for certain problems. But there are still so many challenges um, on the way to achieve a useful large-scale quantum computer. Uh, first of all, we know that the qubits are fragile and very sensitive to errors. Um, quantum information is stored in continuous domain uh, as opposed to classical data that is uh, uh, in discrete form of zero or one. And as a result, any error in the qubit state measurement translate into a different state than it actually is, and this could result in a wrong computation result. So in order to have a useful uh, quantum computer, uh, we need to have a way to correct for errors. Um, so error correction is uh, crucial for a uh, quantum computer to work. Um, so classical computers uh, typically use uh, redundancy, uh, more bits and circuitry uh, to detect errors in the system. And uh, quantum computers use similar scheme by using many physical qubits to work together as a logical qubit with reduced error rates. And it's been shown in the literature that we need about millions of qubits to work together in parallel uh, to enable error correction uh, for a quantum computer. So what is the state of the art now? Uh, the state of the art quantum processor is a 54 qubit uh, Sycamore chip from Google uh, that in 2019, uh, was a paper published that the uh, team at Google showed that they can do something on the quantum computer that cannot really be done uh, on a classical computer. And this is a great step towards uh, having a useful uh, quantum computer in the future. However, we still need to scale this 54 qubit to millions of qubit, and there are so many challenges associated with that. Um, so building a scalable quantum processor is challenging for many reasons. Uh, but here I'm going to focus on only the readout chain uh, and the need for low power hygienic bonus amplifiers. Uh, here you can see schematic diagram of uh, a quantum processor which you have like qubits inside a, a dilution fridge that, that at the temperature of 30 millikelvin and uh, the signal goes out to the four Kelvin stage which you have your cryogenic LNA which is typically a hemp based LNA in the, in the current uh, quantum processors and then it goes out to the room temperature and the rest of the readout chain. Um, so as we said, uh, we, if you need about millions of qubits for, for an air-corrected quantum computer, and if we assume that we can have 10 times multiplexing in the readout chain, uh, so we'll need about 100,000 of these cryogenic LNAs that is uh, shown in here in green uh, in a readout chain. So putting 100,000 of LNA inside a four Kelvin stage, uh, then we can uh, quickly um, understand that the power consumption is gonna be a problem. So, so why we need low power LNAs? Uh, basically we cool down these devices in usually dilution fridges and they have limited uh, power budget at four Kelvin stage around two watt. And if you wanna put more and more LNAs uh, on the readout chain, uh, we need to reduce the power consumption of the, the electronics and especially the, uh, the, the, the LNA inside the cooler. Typically, the um, uh, lunar amplifiers that is used right now, um, they're hemp-based LNA and they uh, dissipate around four or five milliwatt power dissipation. So if we want to fit hundred thousands of them inside a four Kelvin stage, 
uh, we need to bring down the power dissipation by an order of magnitude in the microwatt level. Uh, so let's look at the brief history of cryogenic LNAs and see where they're coming from. And what is the state now? Um, so historically, cryogenic LNAs were developed for uh, radio astronomy application because they have also uh, cryogenically cooled readout chains and started with uh, gallium arsenide fed transistor LNAs in 1980s. Uh, and there, there were some problems with the uh, performance of gallium arsenide at that time, like the mobility was low, so as an alternative, high electron mobility transistors emerged and they improved and matured to get less than two Kelvin noise temperature. Uh, and this is the report at, in the middle. You can see the plot at 1988. And um, in modern uh, days, we have, we are typically using indium phosphide hemp LNAs in recent decades. Uh, for cryogenically cooled applications, uh, quantum computing, radio astronomy, and many more applications. And um, you can see that here in this plot, uh, comparing different technologies, uh, um, uh, noise temperature as a function of frequency, and you can see the indium phosphide hem transistors uh, across a wide range of frequency and very good performance in terms of noise temperature. However, there are some limitations associated with this technology. Uh, for instance, they have high optimal impedance, which makes it hard uh, for us to design and match it for noise uh, performance. They have high flicker noise. They suffer from some gain fluctuations, and the power dissipation, of course, is high. Um, and uh, the last but not least is that they're hard to implement on complex systems on chip, and if we want to scale up the number of um, qubits and have a scalable uh, uh, quantum computer, we want to be able to um, implement complex systems on chip, and uh, we need something that is compatible with um, commercial CMOS technology. So as an alternative option recently, silicon germanium HP transistors emerged, and you can see blue curves here. Uh, uh, the performance of these silicon germanium HPT LNAs are comparable. Um, with the indium phosphide hemp uh, LNAs. And uh, they have very good performance at cryogenic temperature. So the question that I, we wanna ask as an answer is basically, can we design ultra low power silicon germanium uh, LNAs uh, with the same or comparable performance with hemp LNAs for future scalable quantum computers? So we talked about the motivation a little bit, why we need cryo LNAs uh, for scalable quantum computers. And let's take a, uh, a more detailed look at the operation of these transistors, silicon germanium HPTs at low supply voltages for uh, low power dissipation applications. So in order to uh, basically answer the question of is low power LNAs with CG HPTs possible or not, we need to answer two specific questions here. Um, at how low of supply voltage we can operate these LNAs and what happens to the noise in weakly saturated region uh, when you have when you bring the supply voltage down? Um, because the noise is a, a number one important um, um, factor for these LNAs, and it's very important to understand what happens to noise when we reduce the power dissipation of these LNAs. Because there's typically very um, strong trade-off between the power dissipation and the noise performance and other metrics of any electronic uh, component. And uh, it's also true for noise amplifiers. Here you can see uh, current density, uh, milliamp per micrometer square of these transistors as a function of supply voltage. We see as the collector to emitter work voltage. And for the current densities that we care about over here, you can see they have very uh, uh, ideal performance for supply voltages as low as even less than 100 millivolt. So DC-wise, these transistors are uh, performing um, ideally and let's now we need to understand what happens in the rf performance and the noise uh, at, at very low supply voltages around here uh, so in order to answer that question we took a um, couple devices and cooled them down and looked at their performance uh, at low temperature here you can see four plots uh, uh, the collector current as a function of base voltage which we call them gummo curves 
at three different temperature, which is room temperature, 77 and 7 Kelvin. And you can see how this slope uh, is improving well, by cooling down, which means that the transconductance of these devices is improving. Uh, and also you can see the current gain of these devices um, dramatically improving when we cool them to 7 Kelvin. And also the unity gain frequency of these devices are, are also improving uh, significantly when we cool them down. So why these matter? Um, if we look at the minimum noise temperature as a function of uh, beta DC is the current gain, FD is the unity gain of the device, and TA is the ambient temperature, you can see that when we reduce the temperature, which is ambient temperature, beta is improving, FD is improving. So as a result, minimum noise temperature out of these devices should improve significantly, and they're a very good candidate for uh, lunar amplifier design at cryogenic temperature. Uh, so we developed uh, the CGHBT models to understand their performance at cryogenic temperature at very low supply voltages. There exists the, the um, standard model for CGHBTs, but they don't uh, uh, model the, the device performance, noise performance at very low supply voltages. So we uh, came up with this uh, more complete model which has, uh, which actually includes the extra shot noises that happens at very low supply voltages. And we uh, calculated the minimum noise temperature as a function of various uh, device metrics. And we cooled down these devices uh, to uh, basically prove our hypothesis. Uh, we cooled down these devices in a cryogenic probe station and measure the RF and uh, DC performance of these devices. And here you can see this is our probe station, which has the, the RF uh, RMs and DC RMs. And this is a schematic diagram of our measurement setup. Um, and we once we cool them down to 7 Kelvin temperature, we measured all the DC and RF performances uh, to actually uh, prove that our hypothesis um, is valid and we can run these devices at very, supply, at very low supply voltages without impact on the noise. So here you can see the, the top row is the collector current density of the device and the bottom row is the base current density at seven Kelvin, 77 and 300 Kelvin. And you can see they have very ideal performance as I showed previously uh, for the collector current density for supply as low as 0.1 volt and the same was for the base, uh, base current. So DC wise, it's an excellent performance. Uh, so now we uh, also uh, ca uh, characterize the RF characteristics and uh, ca uh, we measured the scattering parameters of the device, uh, uh, again, three different temperatures over a wide range of current densities that we care about. Uh, so we typically design LNAs for less than one milliamp per micron square, so below the red line. And you can see again for FT of these devices still stays almost constant um, over a very wide range of supply voltages and again starts collapsing for less than 100 uh, millivolt or 0.1 volt uh, supply voltages. <clears throat> so we uh, uh, went ahead and based on our DC uh, measurements and RF um, uh, uh, scattering parameter measurements, um, we extracted the minimum noise temperature uh, possible from these devices and the top row is basically the minimum noise temperature at 7 Kelvin. The bottom row is minimum noise temperature at 300 Kelvin. Uh, I, I put three different uh, plots here uh, for one, uh, 300 Kelvin, seven, 77 Kelvin, and 7K at 1 gigahertz. And the bottom row is at 10 gigahertz. So we are uh, covering the 1 to 10 gigahertz frequency range. For quantum computers, we typically design for four to eight gigahertz frequencies. So this, uh, this is a good cover for the frequency range. And you can see the minimum noise temperature remarkably stays almost constant uh, for supply voltages as low as around 100 millivolt or for a little bit higher current densities around 150 millivolt. And uh, this is a very important result for us because it shows that if we uh, design LNAs in a fixed current density, uh, and we reduce the, the supply voltage, we don't see any impact on the noise performance uh, for supply as low as a, a 200 millivolt. And so um, you might ask what happens if you reduce the supply voltage? 
what happens to the linearity of these devices. We actually measure the OIP3, and you can see again, OIP3 stays almost uh, uh, unchanged for supply voltages uh, as low as uh, 100 millivolt. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, our model. So we, based on the scattering uh, parameter uh, measurements, we uh, uh, implemented a model and compared that with our measurements. And these are the S11, S22, S21, S12 on Smith chart. If you're familiar with the Smith chart, uh, we have the uh, model for the supply voltage of 500 millivolt, 200 millivolt, and 100 millivolt, which is a very low supply voltage. And you can see that uh, the red and the dollar lines are matching perfectly, and our model is actually capturing the performance of these uh, transistors at uh, such low uh, uh, supply voltages. So now that the model seems to be working properly, we demonstrated our first microwatt level LNA uh, using our cryo models using discrete transistors from Global Foundries. Um, uh, here is the, uh, the block that uh, has the assembly, and here is the uh, close-up photo of the transistor itself, which is bond-wired to the PCB at the input and output. And uh, the design was for two to four gigahertz frequency range, and we were able to get better than 26 dB of gain over the band and less than five Kelvin noise temperature. And you can see, and these are the reflection coefficients, S11, S22. You can see how perfectly the model is matching our simulations and measurements, basically, uh, uh, and the model is predicting the performance very well. And this design was uh, at 300 microwatt power dissipation. And as I mentioned previously, the, the current uh, uh, LNAs that are used in uh, quantum computers they dissipate about four milliwatt power dissipation. So this is an order of magnitude lower power dissipation for a cryo-LNA. Um, so we went ahead and also measured noise versus power uh, dissipation uh, and to see how our models are holding uh, over a wide range of supply voltage. And the top row is noise temperature, bottom row is our gain. And you can see how beautifully the model is capturing the performance, the blue uh, curve is the performance of the, the LNA itself. Uh, it's uh, capturing the performance and predicting the, the noise as a, as, a, as a function of power dissipation. And this is the first time a model is predicting the power dissipation at, at, as a function of uh, supply voltage uh, at cryogenic temperature. And um, uh, you can see how it, it predicts you can uh, operate at 100 millivolt, and once you go lower than 100 millivolt, your device starts going into uh, the uh, saturation region, and the base to collector junction starts forward biasing, and the performance starts collapsing. But once you are at 200 millivolt uh, supply voltage, you don't see much of a, a, an impact on the noise performance or gain. Okay, so we looked at the um, uh, supply voltage, low power operation of uh, uh, CKHPTs. And so the next step was basically for us to um, move on to integrated circuit uh, ICs and see if we can uh, implement uh, compact integrated circuit LNAs with the same performance. So we designed the CG LNA, a silicon germanium uh, LNA integrated circuit. And you can see the schematic diagram here. And uh, uh, the, the, it was fabricated in the global foundries by CMOS ADHP technology, which has both um, CMOS technology and CG technology as an add-on to that. So if you need any extra circuitry in digital domain, you can use the CMOS um, available. And here you can see a measurement and simulation uh, match uh, uh, matching very well. This is an on-wafer uh, measurement inside a, a probe station. And here's a dye photo of uh, the LNA chip. So after we wafer probed it, we actually packaged the LNA and put it inside the cryostat to measure it uh, at, at cryogenic temperature and be able to actually put it in a fridge with other um, uh, components of the system. So this is the packaged LNA and this is a close-up picture of the chip, uh, which is wire bonded to the input and output of uh, um, the uh, PCB lines. And we actually put that inside a cryostat that goes to temperatures. Uh, uh, um, this, is, this is a room temperature measurement comparison with the simulation. 
and the next one is actually cryogenic temperature that the, the, the uh, cryostat goes to 18 Kelvin and it uh, standalone uh, uh, characterization of this LNA. And the power dissipation of this, this IC is uh, 580 microwatt. And you can see a good match between simulation and measurements for reflection coefficients. And the ripples that you see is because of the long cables inside the cryostat that we didn't have access to them and they're not the embedded from the result, but you can uh, always calibrate for that. And then the LNA performance gain and noise was also uh, measured at uh, 18 Kelvin, a power dissipation of 580 microwatt for the frequency range of uh, four to eight gigahertz. And you can see around seven Kelvin noise temperature and better than 25 dB gain across the band uh, was achieved. Uh, so we looked at the performance as a function of DC power also, and you can see the gain and noise stays uh, almost constant for power dissipation as low as 250 microwatt. And even if you go all the way to one milliwatt, the power dissipation also stays the same. Uh, so he, this is just a comparison with the state of the art at the time. Uh, the paper was published in 2017 at IMS. And you can see this is the work, uh, the noise temperature is almost uh, comparable with the other technologies, uh, but the power dissipation is almost an order of magnitude uh, lower than the other technology. And this is a very promising result, especially for uh, you know, scalable um, systems for a quantum computer that we can achieve almost um, you know, comparable noise performance with much lower power dissipation. Uh, so we looked at other uh, technologies. Tower Jazz technology also has a good transistors. We the designed LNAs again. This is a close-up picture. Good match between our measurements and models. And we were able to achieve, uh, again, two to four uh, gigahertz LNA, better than 27 dB gain, less than four Kelvin noise temperature. And this is the assembly. Um, so in order to actually achieve better performance, uh, there was a work actually uh, published in 2020 at IMS that uh, was a collaboration between IHP and UMass Amherst, and they optimized the devices actually for even better noise performance. Uh, uh, and um, the, the base germanium content in the base of these transistors was actually optimized. And you can see how the, the noise performance was improved uh, from the blue curve uh, to the red curve. So there is um, a lot of room for improvement, basically, if we could directly work with the foundries to improve the, uh, the germanium profile in the base of these transistors to get a better noise performance um, at this um, temperature. Uh, so with that, I want to conclude the talk and we showed that the scalable quantum processors are required for uh, fault tolerant uh, quantum computing and scaling to one million qubit is required for error correction, which result in 100,000 cryogenic LNAs. And limited cooling capacity of the fridges are the problem, and we need very low power LNAs to actually be able to uh, do scalable, um, scalable uh, quantum computers. And with that, thank you very much for attending this talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions.